Hi, this is Jose Luis, and welcome to another video in this series, Introduction to Parametric Modeling. In this hands-on exercise, what I would like to do is I would like to create a freeform facade starting from two random curves that I have modeled in Rhino, but I would like to create an, an algorithm that triangulates that facade into planar panels. And this is very important because very often creating nerves surfaces in the real world is very difficult and costly, but if we panelize them into flat planar panels, then making it out of glass, wood, metal, and any other material is a much easier thing. So in this exercise, I'm going to teach you how to create this triangulation. And of course, it's going to be absolutely parametric, so we can control how many elements are in each direction. We can control the shape of the curves uh, so that we can adapt the geometry of the surface. And another trick that I would like to show you is now how to take all those panels that are somehow in three-dimensional space and reorient them to lay them flat on a, an x-y plane, an x-y plane, so that we make our life easier for drafting them, for putting them in drafting uh, in plans, or for sending this to somebody who might fabricate them with a machine, or like cut them in paper for making a model or anything. And because these te techniques are the ones that we typically use when we do mass customization, being fabricating things where each element is different from the rest, tagging and giving these proper names so that we don't forget which element is which is actually very important. So I will also teach you like the small techniques about how to add labels to each one of the elements to make sure that we know which one is which and we don't lose track of them. So this exercise is going to be pretty cool. It's going to be very similar to the ones that we have done in the past creating triangulations in three-dimensional trusses. It's just that instead of bars, we're going to be using panels. But it's also going to involve data manipulation and some other tricks that I'm going to show you uh, through the exercise. So without further ado, let's get busy and let's do some triangulation. Have I mentioned triangulation is one of my favorite topics? Anyway, let's do it. So let's get started. So what is it that we're going to do in this exercise? Well, the idea is that imagine we are designing a some kind of freeform facade and we're going to be using, for example, two curves to define that freeform facade. If we were to join those two curves with a loft, for example, we would get a nerves curve, which has, as we know, like a really fluid geometry, curvature, etc., etc. But it turns out that if we were to make this in the real world, making a facade that follows the exact shape of a nerve's surface is actually very difficult in material terms, in the real physical world. So very often what we do is we follow processes of triangulation. And this is important because triangles, one of the characteristics that they have is that no matter how they are oriented in three-dimensional space, they are guaranteed to always be planar. And planar is very good in the physical world when we make physical things because making planar things is actually really easy in the physical world, manufacturing planar stuff. Manufacturing curved stuff is very, very difficult and very costly. So very typically, if we, even if we have a very fluid undulated facade, in the real world, what we do is we triangulate that facade into triangular panels. And then these are the panels that we use to cut them from glass or from wood or whatever, and to put them up in the real, in the physical world to approximate that, um, to approximate that, that smooth surface, that smooth curvature. Now, and another process that is very common as well is that when you're modeling this in 3D, you always want to end up having a process where you take all these triangles that are in three dimensional space, and that might be great, for example, for visualization, for rendering, for, uh, for whatever. But if you want to actually make a model of that, or you want to send the drawings of those triangles to whoever is going to make them, to, fab to fabricate them, then having them perfectly orthogonal so that you can draft them in the real dimension or you can cut them with a machine is a very, very useful thing to do. So taking the triangles from three-dimensional space and flattening them into a 
planar XY plane for drawing or for fabrication is a very, very common operation, which is what we're going to be doing here in this exercise as well. So before we start with the whole ordeal of like the triangulation and whatever, the first thing that I would like to do is I would like to start and set myself up in Grasshopper. I'm going to create two curves. I'm going to subdivide them. And then we're going to start taking a look at how to join them with these triangles. Um, so let's go to Grasshopper and let's get this set up and then we can go back and discuss triangulation. I have gone ahead and created myself some stuff to start with. So I was in Rhino and I created these two curves that have um, that live in 3D space and that are a little bit far from each other, a little bit far from each other. And then I'm going to bring them into Grasshopper by using empty curve param parameter components and then loading them with this information. And then I also created myself a slider with an integer to define how many spans are we going to be subdividing this facade into. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to actually create the facade by, but just for visual flavor, because we actually don't really need this. So I just want to create a, like the surface for kind of, again, visual flavor, but I don't actually need this at all, technically speaking. And then what I would like to do is I would like to subdivide each one of those each one of those curves into a series of spans. So that's going to be one subdivision, that's going to be the other subdivision, and the amount of spans is going to be equal to that parameter that I just specified. Okay, so having this, I think we are now ready to start taking a look at what can we do. And I'm actually going to hide the surface because really, we don't really need it. So let's take a look at what are we going to do for triangulation? Now, when it comes to triangulation, the techniques that we're going to be using are going to be essentially the same ones that we have used in the previous videos where we did the, the, the trusses and we did like subgrouping of points and lists, etc. It's going to be very similar. The only difference is that in this exercise, because we want the triangulated elements, in this case, we're not going to be doing matching with lines between two lists of points, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing matching with triangular triangular surfaces between three groups of points um, so that we get this surface entity. And then the idea is that we're also going to be following very similar procedures as we did before. So for example, you can see that the way I have triangulated this surface, there are kind of two groups of triangles. Ones are the ones that start with the bottom left points, if you will, then they go to the right and then they fit into the diagonal. That is like half of the triangles. And then the other half would use a different uh, connection, a different matching logic. So the idea is that I'm going to do this in two steps. I'm going to do one family of triangles first, and then I'm going to do the other one. And the way I'm going to do that is by using this surface freeform, and I'm going to be using this component that is called four point surface. I don't have four points because it's triangles, but this component actually works as well if I just feed it three points. So it creates a surface out of those three points. So now the problem that I need to resolve is how do I select the three lists of points that I need to feed into that component. And that solution is going to be using the same techniques that we have seen before. So as you can see, for example, in my, in my code, you can see that the starting points for each triangle are going to be this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Those are like the main vertices. So if we take it, those points are actually all the points that we have on the bottom, except for the last one. So if I find a way of taking the whole list of points and removing the last one, that collection will be the starting, the collection of points that are the starting vertex of all my, of all my points, of all my triangles. Now for the second points, you can see that the triangles always go use this point here as the second point if we are going anti-clockwise, uh, counterclockwise. So if I find a way of selecting all the points on the bottom 
except for the first one, except for this one, that will be the second list of points that I need for my triangulation. And then you can see that it only follows that the third collection of points is going to be all the points on the top, except for the very last one. So what am I going to do? Very similar to what I did in the previous exercises, I'm going to take the points at the top and the points on the bottom. I'm going to do a little bit of list shifting or sublisting to remove the first and the last element. And then I'm going to use that to triangulate the surface. Let's take a look at how to do that. Remember that I like to be super, super um, OCD about, <laughs> about, uh, about naming things because when I do data, this is a very personal me, when I do data manipulation, I lose track of things very easily. So I'm going to put a box here that is going to contain points. Remember this box doesn't really do anything, but just pass them through, if you will. And I'm going to right click and I'm going to type here, uh, bottom notes, and I'm going to hit the paint bucket so that the name shows up on the component. And I'm going to copy and paste this and I'm going to plug the other ones. And now I'm going to call this top notes. Okay. All right. And now that I have them, here very clearly in a group. Now what I can do is I can now start working with the bottom ones and then I can create a sub list that is going to contain all the points except for the last one. As a usual, I'm going to drop here a point list so that I can see <clears throat> so that I can see the numbers of the indices and I have a clearer visual output of which points are contained in this particular list. So if you remember from my previous videos, I'm going to use the shifting technique to take <clears throat> all the points on this list, all right, and shift them by minus one unit, which will result in a list that contains the same points except for the last one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click here uh, or I'm going to just create a panel where I'm going to type false to deactivate wrapping so that by offsetting the by offsetting all the points one unit I actually lose the last point because it's not wrapping the points anymore. I explained this in previous videos so uh, make sure to check that if you haven't so far. So these are all the points so and I'm going to write here very programmatically bottom bottom nodes minus <clears throat> minus last for example and then i'm going to copy and paste here and i'm going to shift now one positive unit and you're going to see that if i plug this in here what i get is the same collection of points except for the first one so this is going to be minus first correct and then what i'm going to do now is I'm going to copy and paste the whole thing and I'm going to feed this here, the top notes. And then I'm going to visualize the top notes here. So all of this, I'm going to be the top notes minus the last one. And these are going to be the top, the top notes minus the first. Is that correct? Yes, these are the top notes minus the first one. Wonderful. So this has been a way of manipulating the data lists so that I now have data lists. I have collections of points where I'm missing either the first one or the last one. And it's going to be very useful for data matching. So before what we did for data matching was we had the line component that takes two inputs and creates a line between, for example, the bottom minus the last and the top minus the last. Oops and the top minus the last. And you can see that I get all these lines here. This component, the four point surface is going to work very similar. I'm going to take as per my diagram, I'm going to take the collection of all points minus the last, all points minus the first, and then in at the top, all points minus the last. And I'm going to create a triangle using these three collections of points. So now I have bottom nodes minus the last one, bottom nodes minus the first one, and then top nodes minus the last one. And you can see, <laughs> I should do like Daniel Schiffman and have like some sound like, 
Ta-da! Like magic. Magic just happened. So I have now this triangulation, the first family of triangulated vert panels in three-dimensional space. And now, obviously, I'm going to also use a four-point surface to create the, the other triangulation, which is going to be what? It's going to be all these points here. So, it's, so the triangulation is going to be, let me draw this here. Triangulation is going to be like this. I'm going to start here. This is not looking good. I'm going to start here. I'm going to join this one and then this one and then back. So that's going to be this collection of points, the bottom minus the first, then this collection here, the top minus the first, and then this collection here, the top minus the last. This is very difficult to say actually, but it's easier to just see here that if I want to take all of this, so that's going to be bottom minus first, then all of this here, so top minus the last, so right, so minus the first. So I want to take all these ones here. So that's going to be the second point. And the third point is going to be all the top nodes minus the last one. So that's going to be this one here. And now you can see that I have the two families of triangles. One is going to be the ones in the bottom and the other ones are going to be the one that has a base in the top. And let's parameterize this. Now we have more spans, less spans. And technically, if we just crank this up a lot, then we will very basically, very, very, very much approximate the actual NURBS curvature of the surface. But obviously, the more we define, the more difficult it would be to make in the real world. But also, the lower definition we have, you can see that uh, it's kind of not, it doesn't look great. So for the real world, we will need to find some kind of middle ground that it's easy to make, but still kind of satisfies the original curvature, whatever. Okay, wonderful. So now we have the two families of triangulated points or triangulated facade elements. Now what we need to do is we need to take them from 3D space and we need to lay them down flat on the XY plane. How are we going to do that? That's actually going to be a piece of cake. Let's take a look at that. So how are we going to do this? Well, what we want to do conceptually is we have all our triangles in 3D space with whichever orientation they have in, in three-dimensional space. We don't really know that yet. And what I want to do is each one of them, I want to lay it flat in X, Y, Z, in X, Y. And we already discussed, this is really good for drafting, for drawing, for measuring, and for machines that make these things physical, that they fabricate these things. So we will probably have to do two operations where we take the bottom triangles and we lay them flat and the top ones and we lay them flat. But how can we lay them flat? What kind of operation is that actually? Well, taking something that has a particular orientation in three-dimensional space and ends up with another orientation in three-dimensional space, whether be it flat or not, it doesn't really matter. We have already seen that one operation that was really useful for that, and you heard me talk about how I think it's the MVP of transformation, is the orientation, the reorientation, or the change of basis which is an operation that takes an object and takes a reference plane and a target plane and then moves the object from that reference plane into the target plane. So what that means is that in order to do this, we will need to somehow figure out for each particular triangle, we will need to figure out what is a, which reference plane we use for the source, the orientation, and which target plane are we going to be moving it to. For the target, I would say it's going to be pretty easy because what we can do is we can just generate here at the corners, we can generate a set of planes on X, Y, and we already know how to create, for example, one-dimensional arrays or two-dimensional arrays of elements. So we can just do this numerically, but so for the target ones, but for the source ones, it's going to be slightly more complicated because we don't really know where these elements are in 3D space. So we're going to have to come up with some way of figuring out what is where those planes that I have drawn flat would be 
in three-dimensional space so that they contain those triangles in a planar way. And actually, due to how we have worked so far, it's going to be super easy because what I can do is I can try to generate for each triangle, I can try to generate a plane that is based on this corner of the triangle that is oriented towards the first point of the triangle and then whose secondary axis also is oriented towards this other plane, to this other point. We have seen before how we can create planes out of three points and therefore the result of that operation is going to give me some kind of plane that is oriented towards this first point and where, where the second axis, the green one, is going to be oriented in a way that contains this point and therefore since the three points are going to be contained in that plane, the triangle is going to be contained in a planar way inside of that plane. And therefore, when we match this target, this plane as the source to this plane as the target, this triangle is going to end up laying flat on the xy plane. All right? So, and then we will do a very similar operation but for the triangles on top. So for the triangles on top, we will be able to create just like, we're not, I don't know, like these planes here on based on the tip of the triangle. And we can also do those as an array. And then here we would use this point at the center of the plane. We will use this plane as the, um, this point as the main axis and this other point, we will use it as the secondary axis. For example, does it, that can be a way to go. So, Shall we give this a try? Let's give it a, let's give it a try. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to actually create the source planes, the ones that are in 3D. This is actually going to be the easier part, surprisingly, because it's just going to be as easy as taking, going to planes and then creating a plane from three points. So that plane from three points for these surfaces is going, to, is going to basically follow the exact same matching pattern that we use for the surface. So for example, it's going to take the, um, the, it's going to take the bottom nodes minus the last one as the origin. So that's going to be the origin of the planes. Then the first point for the orientation of the x-axis is going to be the, this collection of points here. So I'm going to feed that in there. And then the third point is going to be the one that we had on the top. So that's going to be this one here. And you can see, if you look closely, you can see that these planes are actually oriented in 3D space. You can see, can you see how the plane very nicely fits this triangle here? And can you see how this other plane is very nicely fitting that triangle here? And so on and so on. So we have here now, the origin planes that we're going to use for the transformation. Now, the only thing that we need to do now is we need to create a one dimensional array of planes, these ones here, that we're going to lay flat and that are going to be the target for reorienting the triangles into the ground, into the floor or whatever, however you want to call that. How can I use that? How can I do that? Uh, it's actually going to be super easy. Let me create here somewhere, for example, here. Let me create a simple x, y plane. So one plane that is just flat x, y, and it's here. And now what I would like to do is I would like to copy this plane multiple times in the x direction uh, at a control distance between them. How many times? As many times as triangles I have. How much distance? Whatever, a control distance. So then I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to do a parameter for that. I'm going to type here, for example, spans, uh, panel, I'm going to do panel separation, for example. And that's going to be part of my inputs now. And what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to copy this plane several times in the x direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this plane because remember moving in grasshopper world actually means copying because it's implicit. I'm going to move that in the x direction, but each one of these x vectors needs to be multiplied by a series of numbers 
that go from zero to um, however many elements we have at control intervals. We've seen in previous examples how we can generate a numerical series. For example, uh, we can generate a numerical series that starts at zero, that has the step size is going to be how the distance between those panels, so that's going to be this distance, and the amount of values in the series is going to be the amount of spans. So that's going to be the amount of spans. You can see how if I now take a look at this, you can see that I have 10 numbers going from 0 to 90. If I plug those into the x vector, I get, x, I get 10 vectors from 0 to 90 in the, x, in the x direction. And then if I use those to move the plane, I have generated a collection of 10 planes that are spaced apart 10 units. So how can, what can I do now? Well, it's going to be just as easy as reorienting. Going here, going to Euclidean, going to Orient, and then I would like to orient these triangles, the triangles that I have in three-dimensional space, I'm going to like to orient these triangles. Then the source planes are going to be the ones that I just generated here. So those are going to be the, or the initial planes. And the ones that I created here in the bottom can, are going to be the target planes. And you can see how -da! we have laid all the triangles flat in the XY plane. Nice! That is very cool. And let me just move this a little bit out, out of the way here. And let me play a little bit with this panel separations kind of situation so that I can like squeeze them a little bit, which I kind of like. All right. Wonderful. So we have that. Now we need to do the same operation for the other ones. Now. What we could do is I could just create another plane here and do the exact same operation and have them laid out here as well. But since we kind of see that there's a certain order to how these panels are arranged, I may just want to, I may just want to add, I may just want to increase this spacing and then add the panels here in between so that we have the bottom one and the top one, the bottom one and the top one, the bottom one and the top one, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. That could be an interesting thing to do. So the way to do that is actually going to be super easy. The only thing that we need to do is we need to create, we need to find the planes here in 3D space, but we also need to create a series of planes here that are in the middle. So that's just going to be as easy as starting from a plane that is already halfway through here and then replicating that plane as many times as we have so far. So how can I do that? I'm going to take the original plane and I'm going to move it here one time, half the distance between the spans. So I'm going to move this point, in, sorry, this plane in the x direction, an amount equal to half the span. So I'm going to take the panel separation and I'm going to create an expression, of course, that is going to be x divided by 2. And then I'm going to plug that in here. And then I'm going to use that to fit the x component. All right, so now I have the plane here in the middle. And then I can also just copy that plane. I can take that one single plane and copy it in the x direction multiple times. How many times? The same time amount of times that we did for the other planes, because the, the gap and the spacing and the amount of planes is the exact same one. So now I have the planes for my bottom panels and the target planes for my top panels. All right, so the only thing that I need now are going to be <clears throat> the planes here in the origin to use for the projection or the reorientation operation. So that's going to be very easy as well. I'm just going to create a plane with three points and I'm going to follow the same logic that I followed from for the surface. So I'm going to do bottom nodes first, then I'm going to go for top nodes minus the first one and then top nodes for the last one. 
and I'm going to turn these planes off. And then you can see that <clears throat> the planes are in 3D space and it is true that they are matching, are containing those panels. The only thing, <clears throat> and, then, and then if I use those panels, I use those planes to reorient the panels, I'm going to get this result. I'm going to get, I'm going to orient the panels with this being the source and the new planes here being the target. And the result that I'm going to get is going to be something like this, which is a little strange. So let's take a look at what's going on. So for some reason, this triangle is not kind of oriented like this, but it has the tip here and this is the long edge and this is the diagonal edge and it's kind of rotating 90 degrees, kind of. Why is that happening? Well, if you think about the way we join the points or we fit, fed the points to generate the plane, we use this as the first point, then we use this as the second one, and therefore the main orientation, the X orientation of the plane is pointing this way. And then the third point is here for the secondary direction. So basically the planes are oriented in a way that the sharp tip of the panel is at the origin, and then the long vertical edge is in the main direction. And that is why here you can see that this triangle has the plane on the sharp tip and then the vertical edge is in the main direction. So whether if we like that or not, it's up to us to decide, but perhaps something to make, to make it more clear or more homogeneous with the orientation that we chose before, maybe for these panels, for these ones here, for these planes, we could choose a different way of orienting the planes. So to match how the previous ones were set, maybe what we can do is for the vertical panels, what we can do is we can set the plane on this corner. We can set this as the main orientation and then the sharp tip can be the third point that just sets the secondary direction. The only thing that we're going to need is to just rewire how these planes are generated so that the origin plane, the origin point is this one, the main axis point is this one, and the third one is the other one. So I'm just going to disconnect everything and I'm going to say the origin, so the input for A is going to be all the points on the top minus the first. So that's going to be this one. The B, the orientation of the main axis is going to be all the points on the top minus the last one. So that's going to be this one here. And then the sharp tip is going to be this one here. You can see that my planes are now oriented in 3D space with the origin here, the main direction this way, and then the sharp tip on the other end. And as I do that, you can see that now, what? All the panels have actually kind of rotated 180 degrees in space, and they all have the sharp tip, if you will, pointing upwards. So this would be the planes on the bottom and this, all the ones here would be the planes on the top. Obviously, this is not guaranteeing in any way that there are no overlaps. So for example, if I actually choose to, to do, for example, a sh le less spans, you can see how they start overlapping. But if I should choose to do more slabs, more spans, you choose how they overlap less, but there's more space in between them. So there are ways of making this process a little smarter, but we're not going to get into that in this exercise. All right. But this was, um, as you can see, we have basically taken this, all this geometry and we have laid it flat and these panels are ready to just go into drafting or go into production, fabrication, or whatever you want to make out of them. Uh, coming from 3D space. I think this is a pretty cool exercise and I've definitely done this process a lot myself to fabricate physical models out of cardboard of wool or wood or that kind of stuff. One last thing that I would like to do before we wrap up this exercise it is, is the fact that when we start working with this kind of definitions or this kind of modeling where each element is unique, it's individual, it's different from all of them and we want to fabricate things, the problem of knowing which element is which and where it goes in 3D space becomes way more pronounced than if we're doing serialized or mass or mass production. So 
tagging elements properly and giving them names or numbers or whatever becomes really important because it's a way of getting of keeping track of where each element has to go. So before we do, before we wrap it up, I would like to do a quick example of how to tag, how to give names to each one of these panels and therefore be able to track them uh, in the drafting, in fabrication, in whatever. We can, here in Grasshopper, we can go to the display category and there are, in the dimensions category, there's a bunch of components that allow you to draw things like annotations, text, etc. in the view part. So one of the ones that I like the most is the text tag 3D because it allows me to just create text in three dimensions that um, in, with a particular orientation. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, um, I'm going to plug, I'm going to drop this component. I'm going to say, what is the location and the orientation of the text tag? And you can see how it's asking me for a plane. Oh my God, what a coincidence. I do have planes here for 3D panels and for the flattening, the flattened panels on the top. So what a coincidence. I'm going to use these panels, these planes here to draw the text. And the text that I'm going to draw, for example, is going to be panel. So if I do that, you can see that I have some display text on the corner of each one of these planes saying panel. And I think there is a size component that I can also customize. So I can make the text smaller, bigger, and I can even change the color, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But obviously, I don't want the word panel to be the same for all of them. I would like to have some kind of code that differentiates each one of the panels individually. So what I can do is that I can create a list of tags that is going to be unique for each panel. So for example, for the bottom ones, I could say I'm going to create a code that is going to be B hyphen zero, B hyphen one, B hyphen two, B hyphen three to ID to tag each one of the panels individually. In order to do that, it's going to be as easy as creating uh, a string. So where do I have string manipulation? Here, I have under sets, under categories, there are there is a category called text that I can use to generate, modify, manipulate, and do operations with text. So for example, I'm going to join here. <clears throat> I'm going to concatenate text. <clears throat> and the way I'm going to concatenate that is that the first fragment is going to be a, for example, B and a hyphen, or I'm going to actually uppercase. I'm actually going to uppercase that. Oh, sorry, uppercase B. So that's going to be one. And the other one would need to be a list of numbers from zero to however many panels I have. So that's going to be, I can create a series of numbers that are going to start at zero. The step size is going to be one, so the default. And how many values I'm going to have in the series? The same amount of values as spans I have in my definition. So, in, so that's going to be here. I'm going to have a list of numbers, 0 to 10, for example. That's the number of spans. And then if I plug this in here, you can see that the result is a list of tags that go from 0 to 10. If I plug that into the text tag component, you can see that the tag is now B0, B1, B2, B3, blah, 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 all the way to B10 at the end. And then, so that can be one. And then I could, do a, I could use a very similar technique to tag the other ones, that ones that are on the in-between, except that for those ones, I probably want to concatenate a different list which is going to be instead is going to be with the T. So it's going to be T hyphen. And then I'm going to use those as the text tags here. And maybe I move this here to make things a bit clearer. And maybe I move this here to make things clearer and use the same slider for both. All right. And now you can see that I now have, I now have the tag elements B0, T0, B1, T1, B2, T2, etc. And I could use these panels if I wanted those tags to also show up here in 3D space. I could also use them to um, I could also use them to 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 
to make sure that I know where these panels are coming from. All right. And I think with this, I am kind of happy with this exercise. Um, this was panelizing a facade in triangles in 3D space and then taking those triangles and laying them flat on the XY plane for drafting or for fabrication or for whatever. All right. This involved a little bit of data manipulation and tricks. I hope this was useful and this definition is definitely, definitely super useful for many things such as, uh, you know, um, yeah, for many things, for models, for drafting and whatever. I hope this was useful. I hope we learned some data manipulation with this and I will hopefully see you on the next video or the next exercise when I plan, where I plan on doing this very similar technique, but instead of just on one surface with one strip of triangles, I would like to do it on a surface that has a two-dimensional strips a strip of triangles. It's going to involve serious data manipulation, but it's also going to be super, super useful for all of us. Thank you very much. And if you like what you saw, maybe like this video, maybe subscribe to the channel, maybe turn on notifications, you know, all those things. Thank you very much and see you on the next video on this series.